Uh, anyways, guys, uh, Professor Bill, Comic Book University, and I am live uh, in an interview with Richard Cumley. He is the founder, the, the creator of Captain Canuck. If you're not familiar with Captain Canuck, you're clearly not Canadian. And I personally have only just discovered Captain Canuck one summer ago at the Fan Expo Canada, which was held in downtown Toronto. And I am a huge fan as of late so <laughs> also i had the distinct pleasure of meeting mr cumley and now he agreed to do this uh, live interview uh mr cumley over to you sir <laughs> hi <laughs> i could have said it better there, there are there are a number of Americans that are familiar with captain canuck i might add, add i agree i wonder if a lot of them actually traveled here first because <laughs> Yeah, I've been into comics my entire life, William? and I swear... Go ahead. <laughs> Sorry? All right, William, yeah. I missed a bunch of that. Uh, there was a lot of breakup there. Ah, but sorry. Some, I don't know what, what happened, but uh, I missed a lot of what you said. Sorry. Uh, a lot of delay. Um, the uploads... Okay, so anyway, I was uh, just indicating that I think that many of these uh, people who know about Captain Canuck maybe have traveled. I just don't see the comics in... Uh, I'm from New Jersey myself, as you know, and I've just... I've never seen a Captain Canuck comic in my life. And my wife, who is Canadian, when she mentioned the character, and when I saw somebody cosplaying as Captain Canuck, I, I thought it was just like uh, the Guardian from... Um, uh, Department H and Alpha Flight for Marvel Comics X-Men, which we are going to talk about a little bit later in the interview. <laughs> in the meantime, sir, if you don't mind, uh, could you tell me how you came across the idea for Captain Canuck? Okay. <clears throat> it, it, it really goes way back to 1971. I, it was either late 1971 or or early 1972, not sure exact date. I met uh, Ron Leishman, uh, and I became friends with uh, Ron Leishman in Winnipeg, Manitoba. <clears throat> Excuse me. In fact, I met him at church, and uh, I had seen him once before, uh, but just you know didn't know him. But I recognized him as one of the students going to Red River College, taking advertising art in 1970 and in 1971 I joined the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints uh, which uh, more commonly called Mormons and, uh, <clears throat> and I didn't know that Ron was a member and I met him at church and we got we would get together and, and chat and it was Ron who uh, who really suggested the idea that there should be uh, a, a Canadian superhero in a Canadian comic book series. And uh, we talked about it a number of times. He sketched out a costume. We, um, we debated whether we should call him Captain Canuck or Captain Canada. And <clears throat> I soon discovered that there were about three other Captain Canadas. And some of them were really goofy. One of them had moose horns and, and uh, you know, another wore a strange hat. And that, you know what I mean? Um, and what really kind of turned turned me off from using, you know, coming using the name Captain Canada was I went into a Hudson Bay store in Winnipeg and I saw a sweatshirt that had a, a Superman drawing on it, an old Superman drawing. Somebody had just lifted a Superman drawing, a really old one, removed the S, replaced it with a maple leaf and had Captain Canada underneath. And, uh, and that, that's, that's the moment I said, okay, no way we're going to use Captain Canada. It's going to be Captain Canuck. And that was really, I guess, um, when the, the whole, that was about the year 1973, when I guess the, the whole idea was cemented in my head, <clears throat> excuse me, um, to go ahead and do this. Now, uh, Ron oh, Leishman was about, at that time was working in northern Canada and in western Canada to save money to serve a mission for the church. And uh, about the time he left on his mission was when I really began working on the comic book. 
And I should mention that I really didn't have a background in comic books. Uh, I had to kind of, uh, you know, get a quick education on 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 comic books. It's not that I read them every now and then, but it wasn't something I was extremely interested in or um, or, or or collected or anything like that. And um, so, but I so you know I made quick study. I started uh, reading comic books and. Um, uh, looking at the art, and uh, I, I had been an artist for, I'd worked as a sign painter as a, as a uh, in my early teens. I had done uh, crest design work from age of 17 on. I had been an embroidery, I'd uh, done embroidery design and even uh, clothes styling for, mostly for women's outerwear. Uh, that's what I did for my day job. Uh, kind of thing, and uh, Winnipeg was a big garment industry town, and I did a fair bit of that for a number of manufacturers. So, and I and I even did posters for one of the manufacturers, Westcott. I did a series of of posters for them. So my background was, you know, illustration primarily, illustration and design. And um, I started working on the comic book and. Uh, doing all the research uh, about distribution and all of that in in 1974. So in 1975, I published the the first issue of Captain Canuck uh, from Winnipeg, Manitoba. It was printed in Winnipeg, Manitoba, uh, in full color. Uh, in fact, the the printing method that I used was superior to all other comic books being printed at that time. Uh, we used heat, the, the printer used heat set webs. Uh, we had much better color. I used a, 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 a different coloring method than uh, all the other comic books we were using at that time. So we're talking 1975. And, um, and that was the beginning of, um, of Captain Canuck. At the beginning of World War II, the Canadian government... Um, made it illegal for non-essential items to be um, exported into Canada. Uh, and, and that, of course, that included comic books. So what that meant was that no, none of the American comic books were making their way into Canada. And much like today, uh, Canadian consumers, Canadian readers purchased uh, comic books that were published by American companies just like Americans did. In fact, the U.S. has always treated Canada just like another state. You know what I mean? We're just, you know, as far as, uh, you know, the marketers are concerned and the distributors are concerned, Canada is just one other state to distribute product to. And not that I'm complaining about that, but that was the, the case and it still is the case. Um, so what that did... Uh, when comics were con considered a non-essential item and therefore banned from distribution in Canada, that opened the doors to Canadian publishers who prior to that uh, could not compete with the American publishers. And um, so it opened the doors for a lot of upstarts. A number of them started publishing comic books. And one of the titles was called Johnny Canuck. And Johnny Canuck was um, not a superhero. He was actually a soldier and a, an adventuring soldier. And in one episode, he punches Hitler. And I believe that uh, Captain America does basically the same thing in an issue dur published during World War II. And uh, <clears throat> so I did not know about Johnny Canuck until issue number two of Captain Canuck. And I got a phone call from Les Barker, uh, which is the name he went by, um, who created and illustrated Johnny Canuck during World War II. So I'm talking 1975, 76 is when he gave me a phone call. And I was, um, I, I didn't know this history uh, about, you know, the War Measures Act and, and banning American comic books and the creation of Johnny Canuck and, and then, other Canadian comic books. I didn't know about that until I got that phone call. And then I started to do a little bit of research. And, and in issue number three of Captain Canuck, we published an article 
on the, on Johnny Canuck and that whole business of publishing during World War II of Canadian comic books. That's cool. Did you get that? Yeah, I did. That's very cool. I forgot that I had to mute right. my uh, my mic. <laughs> Uh, yeah, okay. Captain America Comics issue number one and two. He punched Hitler. He never actually punched Hitler in the face in the uh, comics. <laughs> Only on the covers. Oh. Um, okay. <laughs> okay, so Comely Comics, you had your own uh, comic line for a while. Can you talk about that? Yeah, well, <clears throat> I, I self-published uh, Captain Canuck in the beginning. And... Um, so, you know, trying to come up with a name, um, Comely Comics just seemed to be the natural, uh, you know, um, solution to that problem. You know, what, what name should I, I give this publishing company? Uh, really, in the beginning, it was just me. And uh, I had my younger brother helping me, you know, with just office duties at the beginning and, and mailing and all that kind of stuff. Uh, so, and, and his last name was coming too, of course. So, um, it, you know, it just, um, it just seemed to be a natural fit for what I was doing. And, and we, the name was used even later on when I had other investors come on board, uh, we continued to use it. It, it had become a bit of a brand, uh, by that point. So, um, you know, and, and and even it was licensed even later on to somebody else who published a four part uh, series, uh, Captain Connect series, and and I, I licensed them to do so, and and part and parcel of the license was the use of of Captain uh, or or Comedy. Cool. Uh, okay. So, wow. Tell me you didn't hear that. <laughs> Um, okay, so I heard you. You you finally heard them, huh? I told you they're loud. <laughs> All right, so currently, I sorry, I heard you. Did I mention William that I'm the father of eight children? You, I have seven sons and one daughter, and I, I have ten grandchildren at this point in time. So um, <laughs> I've heard the odd <laughs> scream and yell of children in my lifetime. <laughs> uh, I, you did not mention that. I did, however, read online. You had eight kids. I didn't know gender specifics, and I did not know about ten grandchildren. My word. <laughs> yeah. So. Okay. So, uh, Chapter House Comics. You're currently with them. You are the editor in chief of all things Captain Canuck related. Correct. And Chapter House Publishing is really only about three years old. Uh, the first uh, issue published by Chapter House, and by the way, Chapter House is owned and was founded by uh, Fadi Hakim, uh, based in Toronto. And Captain Canuck uh, Summer Special 2014 was the, was the first issue uh, published by Chapter House. Very cool, very cool. Um, and oh, go on. And uh, they started seeing the series in 2015. Okay, yeah, you signed the uh, the first issue of that. Actually, it's a funny thing um, for anybody listening. I actually met Mr. Richard Cumley at a, a comic, not a comic convention, on Free Comic Book Day. He came to a local uh, area in Mississauga. And you signed a uh, an issue zero on Free Comic di Book Day for me, and I realized after the fact that I guess that was last year's Free Comic Book Day issue. Two thousand fifteen. Okay, so two years ago. It was uh, two years ago. <laughs> yeah. So I and said that was the very first mm -hmm. Free Comic Book Day edition. Yeah. Okay, uh, so there was one this year also, and I did not pick it up because I figured, oh no, I got a signed copy. <laughs> so I missed oh. out. <laughs> uh, it's all good. It's well, all good. There was uh, approximately 80,000 printed, and somebody still still has a copy somewhere. Yeah, somebody might. Um, so I'm kind of glad you did the interview with me today. Tomorrow is New Comic Book Day, so 
I will do my rounds and I will try and find <laughs> said free comic if there's an extra one. <coughs> so you are also an inventor. You know, you don't just sit around. You're also an inventor. You invented the comely crane. You said there you have no engineering background. Uh, yet, I used to teach uh, overseas. I used to teach science, amongst other things. And uh, the eight basic... Uh, tools of the trade, uh, some you know, like the the pulley, the wedge, the lever, and you use the lever in this particular uh, with a weight counterbalance. Uh, what was your inspiration to create the Comely Crane? Well, in the 1990s, uh, later 1990s, I started. I worked as a commercial artist. I've worked as a commercial artist all my life. Um, doing all kinds of things. Uh, I did uh, children's books, greeting cards, lots of advertising, um, all kinds of, uh, you know, commercial art work. Uh, I did um, editorial illustration. I did a fair bit of that. Uh, in the uh, 90s, um, really just in an effort to bolster, you know, income um, and, you know, seeing that some of my um, my illustration work was was kind of fading, you know. I mean, that was happening with a lot of illustrators. I started to do video production, and I was really interested in in video production, and had taken a like a, a continuing ed course in it in 1985. So I and this was just the very beginning of digital cameras. Uh, in, in, you know, prior to the late 90s, it was all analog and they were big, cumbersome, uh, r relatively expensive cameras. But these newer, smaller cameras were easier to use. And um, so anyhow, I, um, I started to do video production and, and um, I was in California uh, with one of my sons. And we took um, a three-day, uh, kind of a three-day workshop on video production, all things to do with video production. And um, so while I was there, I saw a crane. I saw a crane being used. And I said, I thought, um, wow, th this is a great tool, you know, to get some really good shots with. And, uh, and I bought, I actually bought three of them. And the reason I bought three is because I was intending to sell a couple of them back in Canada. And uh, sort of to cover the cost of the one I was going to keep. So I took it back up to Canada. Um, I, uh, I actually went to a, a, a store in Toronto with the idea, the, the, whole, the idea was I was going to be a distributor for this small sort of, uh, Manufacturer, he was kind of a really small manufacturer. I was going to um, kind of distribute his cranes for him in Canada, and I went to this store. I, I'll leave it unnamed for now. Um, and um, the the sales manager took a really good hard look at this crane. He said, "Yeah, this is crane would be good." We, you know, we spent a, a fair amount of time looking at it. And in the end, he said, you know, I like the idea of a crane, but this one's not very good at all. And, and I kind of walked out of there rather dejected, thinking, oh, brother, this is, you know, what am I going to do with these things? You know what I mean? Like, and um, so I happened to live in Cambridge, Ontario at the time. And Cambridge and other cities in and around southern Ontario have a lot of of manufacturing, metal fabrication. There's lots of tool and die makers, uh, lots of metal fabrication. Uh, so I had lots of resources. And I, I, so first thing I did was I, I had made notes of all the, the things that um, the sales manager had pointed out to me that were, were faulty with this particular crane that I, I, I made notes of all of them. And so I did some drawings, uh, you know, where I, um, I figured out improvements. And, um, and then I um, basically, eventually, I made, uh, a mo I made a, a, well, you know, for lack of a better word, a sample 
and um, and then I and in the process of making the sample, we solved other problems, and we came up with other solutions that made the, 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 my crane even better. And eventually, I made uh, I, the first batch I made was thirty of them. I sold them, and I just kept making batches and making improvements all the time. Every batch I made, I made more improvements. And in fact, the very last batch, that's when I finally got around to calling it the Comley Crane, was so to almost very, very, very different from the first crane that I manufactured. And a lot of that was, uh, you know, to the thanks of a good friend of mine, uh, Mitch, uh, Michel Morissette is his, his name. He, um, and um, he's, he is a, a, a mechanical genius, in my opinion. Look at something and say, we do this, 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 and this. And, and I would be, and, and it would all go right up. It, he would, it would take him, you know, about three times to explain it to me before I really caught, caught his vision. And, uh, yeah, he had 10 times more acumen when it comes to uh, mechanical engineering and, uh, you know, and design than, than I did. And, and then just implementing some of his suggestions vastly improved my, my latest model. Now, I haven't been making them for about a half a dozen years. I got so busy with Captain Canuck, uh, and cranes started to fall off. Drones are now <laughs> taking over in a lot of cases where cranes used to get those high shots. Well, now there's, there's cheap drones that can do all kinds of things that cranes can't do, and they're kind of taking over. So uh, fortunately, you know, I got real busy with Captain Canuck uh, at a good time. But, but manufacturing cranes was definitely... Uh, a good source of extra income when we need it, because it's it can be a struggle being uh, an artist, a commercial artist, or you know you can go through periods where business is slow. It, it is a business, you know what I mean. I'm I'm not working for anybody else. I'm I'm totally independent, and I have to go out there and hustle the business and 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 uh, satisfy the the requests that I get. And sometimes it can be slim pickings. Yeah, you know the feeling. I, I think in agriculture they call that the lean years. <laughs> yeah, wow. we had that. See, that's something that I never would have found out just by looking at those videos on YouTube. <laughs> so, yeah. you also you were a teacher for a while, and you still do some teaching dates once in a while. Tell me about that. Sure. I, I think the first time I taught. Uh, a class was in 1989, and that was through uh, an art store, and I would, would teach right at that art store. Then I went on to teach um, uh, continuing ed courses at two local colleges here in southern Ontario, uh, Conestoga College and Mohawk College. Both of them are relatively close to me here. Uh, and um, so I taught continuing ed courses, or night, night classes, uh, so to speak, uh, for a, a number of years. And it was kind of like a part-time thing to, you know, generate some extra income. And then in uh, 2006, Mohawk College uh, wanted to um, uh, create a course, a one-year postgraduate course on script writing uh, and illustration, primarily for comic books although we did touch on storyboarding and children's books as well. But primarily it was all about illustrating and writing for comic books or, or um, you know, graphic uh, narrative, um, uh, sequential art, you know, to be more correct. And, and I did that for one year and, and basically I, I, I went back to work. I, you know, I, I guess I found... Uh, teaching one or two nights a week was a little easier than for me than teaching full time. And as a full time teacher, I had to grade people. I had, you know, I, I had some unhappy students, uh, you know, who weren't happy with my my analysis and, and grading of their work. And and I just found it a lot more stressful than I than I originally thought I would. You know what I mean? I thought it would be a walk in the park, and it sure wasn't. So, 
No, I, I agree. I actually taught uh, in the Middle East for five years. Um, I taught at the university level eventually, um, uh, high tech school in between. But my first three years were actually teaching in the uh, third grade. And I think that I finally had enough. I had one uh, student's father come in and uh, curse me out in Arabic. Uh, so I understood maybe a third of what he said. <laughs> and uh, it was because he uh, because I gave his, his son an F in English. And I said, well, who teaches him English at home? Who's his tutor? He says, I am. I said, you can't speak yeah. English, though. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it took him a while to understand the irony of it. <laughs> Uh, I've, I finally got a little tired of teaching. I, I, I come to realize that at one point yeah. when yeah. when I was a kid, if I got a letter home to my father, uh, he would say, you know, what did you do? Today, if a student gets a letter home to their parent, the teacher goes or the, the parent goes to the teacher and says, what did you do? <laughs> yeah. 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 A, a very different attitude. I know. I know. And, but you know, my, my students were all adults and I have, I have, don't get me wrong, I have fond memories been teaching them. Um, and, uh, but the, the one big problem was that Mohawk had made it a postgraduate. Illustration or, or, um, you know, English, uh, you know, you had to have some, uh, you know, or already have a degree before you could take this one-year postgraduate course. So we only had 15 people in that that first year. And I, I really think, uh, you know, Mohawk, you know, that was, a, that was a mistake, a big mistake on their part. The, the course could have been, had a ton more uh, students if it would have been opened up as a, as a course open to anybody, not not just people who already had a degree. Sorry, I had a hard time getting my mic off of mute there. <laughs> so, no. uh, all right. The last thing uh, I want to discuss, and this should be the real juicy, meaty part, <laughs> um, The Guardian. Yeah. First off, I want to set up for, for fans out there who maybe aren't so familiar with the, uh, the characters. Uh, Captain Canuck, as we mentioned, started in July, the cover date of July 1975. And the first time that we ever heard of the character The Guardian over in Marvel Comics in the X-Men, before it was an Alpha Flight comic, uh, was in, uh, I don't remember which month, but I know it was 1978. So a full three years later. And here's this character called The Guardian, part of the Alpha Flight. They eventually got their own comic book. And uh, the Guardian, the leader, had a costume that looked, I'm sorry, exactly like Captain Canuck. And uh, maybe you could uh, shed a little light on that. That was Chris Claremont and uh, doing the writing, and John Byrne did the artwork for that. Um, over to you, sir. Yeah. Well, it's John Byrne happened to live in Calgary at that time. And in fact, in, in something like 1977, I was on a panel with him at a uh, some sort of a comic convention in Edmonton, Alberta. Um, and I can't, you know, comic conventions way back in, at that time were much smaller. And, uh, and I'm assuming it was a comic convention, but I knew John Byrne. Uh, and um, he does, by the way, in that very first issue of Alpha Flight, which is 1982, he does basically admit that the character is patterned after uh, Captain Canuck. And now, really, it, you know, the mistake that I made was that in 1978, I should have, or I should have had a lawyer write a letter to Marvel and say, way too close, confusing, you got to change the character, you got to change his costume much more because he's way too confusing to this day. I have people come up to me at a comic convention and say to me, uh, you know, how come you let Marvel have Captain Canuck, you know, um, back then or questions like that. And then that's when I start pulling out my hair and saying, ah, <laughs> that, that, you know, that, that was not Captain Canuck. That was Marvel's character designed by John Byrne, patterned after Captain Canuck, rather um, unimaginatively, in my opinion, 
they could have, you know, worked a little harder, uh, you know, t- on that character. It was just look just so much like a, just a, a barefaced ripoff. And um, so I, I didn't do that. Unfortunately, if I, th- I'm pretty sure if I would have done that or had a lawyer, right. Uh, right I would, it would have, um, it would, you know, it would, it wouldn't have uh, had that problem years later, where there's people are talking about Captain Canuck with Marvel. And, uh, anyhow, it um, it's a mistake that I made uh, in not uh, going after Marvel a long time ago, um, and um, I wish I had of. Uh. Now I'll, I'll I'll mention a couple of. Uh, about that, Stan Lee around that time was touring universities in Canada and the United States, and he often he would tell audiences, at least according to an article that I read, he was telling audiences in Canada when he would visit a university in Canada and speak to whoever would come and listen to him. And I don't think he got very big crowds, but. Uh, he would tell them that Marvel was going to buy Captain Canuck and take it under its wing. You know what I mean? Uh, make Captain Canuck a part of the, the Marvel universe. Uh, I think he was just saying that to Canadian students just as a somehow to connect with them, to relate to them, because Marvel, no one at Marvel ever contacted me, uh, even suggesting that they were interested in doing that. Now, very recently, I met, I saw Jim Shooter, who I met back in the 70s. I visited Marvel um, probably in 76 or 77. And um, uh, Jim Shooter said to me, he said, yeah, it's too bad you didn't write that letter because Marvel would have probably given you money, <laughs> you know, just uh, um, hush money or whatever, you know. Uh, and uh, so, anyways, I, I the lesson here is that you, one needs to act when one realizes one needs to act, and I didn't act at that time. I was too busy doing other things. That's actually really sad. First off, uh, you sound a little bit like you're doing a little self-inflicted uh, victim blaming. It's not the fault of the victim, <laughs> um, and I yeah. do believe that. Yeah, you were victimized in that particular regard. Um, funny, the thing yeah. you said about Stan Lee, because it was just announced today that a Chinese company just bought his, um, his POW company with an exclamation point at the end, POW. So, uh, <laughs> so much for, uh, owning Captain Canuck. He's, uh, <laughs> technically his company is now owned by the Chinese. <laughs> That's not Marvel, mind you. That's just Stan Lee, uh, his, his wow. company. Yeah. Now, you know, Stan is, yeah. Yeah. What's he going to do with all that money? He's, uh, you know, he, he's, he's what, 95 years old? 94. I, <laughs> he must have something in mind to do with all that money, I guess. He's uh, still allowed to keep his position. How old is he? He is 94 years old. His, I think his birthday 94. is the 24th okay. of December. So he just turned 94 uh, around there. I have it up here. I just don't want to rip apart my calendar. All right. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, he um, yeah, he still gets to keep his position in the company. So he's still a spokesman and all that good stuff. Uh, yeah. He'll still be making money, but, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. Wow. So, anyway, um, also... I um, hope I have that kind of energy when I'm 90. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> well, his last, his last appearance was yeah. at that comics... Uh, uh, Fan Expo Toronto that I went to when I first learned about Captain Canuck. Um, that was the last appearance he made in Canada. So no, yeah, he is uh, slowing down. Let me correct you on that. Oh, he was also in Cal- I was uh, a guest at the Calgary Fan Expo, which took place at the end of April. So just what uh, a week or so, a week, a little over a week ago, and Stan was at the Calgary Comic Convention. See, so, now I'm going to have to have some words with Mr. Lee, <laughs> Mr. Lieberman. 
<laughs> yeah. That's all good. So, no, I, I think maybe he's just feeling better. Maybe <laughs> after Toronto, he recuperated and he said, heck, I'm still good. Let's go. <laughs> it's a possibility. It was advertised as the last time. Heck, how many times did Ozzy Osbourne say he was going to tour for the last time? <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah. Well, yeah. he changed his mind. I guess so. So um, Fox Studios is apparently talking about doing a uh, an Alpha Flight uh, story one of these days. Uh, I don't know if they're going to do a TV show, a movie, or what have you, but maybe you can get some credit uh, in the literally in the credits for that. Yeah, maybe. Well, that's... I doubt it, but I don't think they'll want to do that. But who knows? Uh, that's a shame. So. That's all the questions I have for you. Um, is there anything else, uh, something cool coming up maybe? Uh, well, there's lots of things Captain Canuck-wise coming up. Uh, I work uh, closely with Fadia Kim, owner and publisher of Chapter House. Uh, somebody I hope that you'll interview as well in, in, the, you know, in the near future. Because there's lots of exciting stuff that he's working on uh, with other properties as well that uh, you know Chapter House is involved with. <clears throat> he does some creator-owned uh, properties. He publishes some of those, and he has other properties, including one uh, you know that was popular in India that he is you know now publishing. But uh, as far as Captain Canuck is concerned, uh, there's lots of things coming. Uh, on CBC, which is a Canadian Broadcasting Corporation here in uh, Canada. Uh, so they're going to do uh, an animated series aimed at a, a younger audience. And that probably won't be on the air until next year. Um, there, um, Jay Baruchel is, is getting more and more involved with us. Jay Baruchel, the Canadian actor, uh, a number of people recognize his name. And uh, we have, um, uh, we're working on, there is going to be a live action movie eventually. Uh, it, I have optioned the rights to a live action movie a number of times over the years. Uh, but this time we're much, much, much closer to getting the film made. And there's also going to be an animated uh, film, uh, feature length film made in the coming future and they're all on the drawing board they're all uh you know the wheels are in motion for those and fatty hakim is m instrumental in making all of that happen uh what the i have a ma a, a licensing agreement with fatty hakim and 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 one of the reasons i work so closely with him to to help him make it all work so lots of exciting stuff um there's some stuff i can't mention but are coming out next year. <clears throat> Lots of new uh, uh, comic book, Captain Canuck comic books and, and licensed products are coming out in the relatively near future. Uh, and we do have a, uh, you know, I, I'm sorry that you're not able to find Captain Canuck in some of your local stores, um, but I know there are many, many stores, comic book stores in the United States that are carrying Captain Canuck. And I have been a guest at, uh, at a few comic conventions in the United States, I uh, have done signings in stores in the United States, and uh, I meet uh, many, many uh, Captain Canuck fans. Some, of, many of them, to my surprise, have all the original series, which were published between '75 and uh, the end of 1980. And uh, I meet a lot of them when I'm down there. Uh, <clears throat> I was at the Heroes Comic Convention there in North Carolina. Uh, Charlotte, North Carolina, and I, I don't think I've ever been so busy in my life uh, talking to people on signing Captain Canuck as I was at that comic convention down in the States. And, uh, and, and what was interesting about the experience is I had people coming up to me with, you know, thick southern accents and, you know, they were from nearby states and or from the area. And to me, they sounded like they had real thick southern accents. And maybe to the locals they didn't. But, um, and they would come with their complete sets of Captain Canuck. And many of them had never been to Canada. 
And uh, so we, you know, there are lots of fans down there um, who, despite the Canadian connection, um, still like the comic book. So that is cool. That is that is so cool. I swear, I wish I would have, you know, heard about Captain Canuck earlier in my life. I just, I don't know, it's just always wrong place, wrong time. <laughs> but. Um, and if, I don't know if it's going to make you feel better, it does, doesn't yeah. make me feel any better, but that comic book store I used to always go to in New Jersey, uh, it actually closed down last year. So, <laughs> <coughs> um, maybe it's because they didn't have enough Captain Cook oh. for sale, but, um, I'm being silly now. But yeah. anyway, um, yeah, I did see, uh, five short films, animated films for, uh, Captain Canuck on, um, Chapter House, uh, on YouTube. Uh, I watched those uh, recently over the past couple of days, and uh, they said that they were supposed to make a season two. Did they ever put that up? Uh, episode one of season two is up. Okay. Uh, the rest of the series is coming. Uh, this is uh, produced by Fadia Kim. Uh, that first series has been very popular. Uh, it, it's available online, not just YouTube, but uh uh, on the Chapter House uh, website, that's chapterhouse.ca, and you can see it there as well. Um, it and we we uh, we've sold many many copies of the that whole series on DVD, which includes interviews and the making of etc. Nice. And um, yeah, it won it won the uh, Geeky Award, by the way. Nice. So it uh, yeah and. Um, and as, if you, you've seen from the cast, we have a uh, big name on the cast. Uh, they're all Canadians, but the, most people will know these actors. So, um, you know, they've been very uh, prominent in a number of, of, of TV series that um, many Americans watch as well. So Nice. Well, I'm looking forward to also seeing you do some... Uh guest cameos on or a guest cameo for the uh captain canuck live action movie uh much like stan lee does for his <laughs> hello yeah that's the idea you know i mean okay we're we're, we're kind of copying what the marvel has done in their movies but anyways oh so be it. yeah they deserve it anyway <laughs> uh Mr. Richard Cumley, ladies and gentlemen, uh, sir, I want to thank you very much for doing yeah. this interview, yeah. taking the time out of your uh, busy schedule. You're very welcome. All right. And I'm going to end this live stream now. Thank you much, Professor Bill, Comic Book University, class dismissed.